Uh, thank you very much for coming. It's a tremendous pleasure uh, to welcome everyone here to the 50th reunion of the Center for Development Economics. Um, this, is the, um, this is the shortest welcome you're going to get because the real welcomes come, uh, uh, come tonight at dinner. But uh, uh, I speak for the faculty in saying it's a tremendous honor to be associated with the CDE. Uh, and it's great that we were able to get uh, uh, such a large number of alumni to, to turn out for the event. Um, uh, the first panel, uh, appropriately enough, is going to be uh, on the role of the CDE and more broadly on the role of education and development. Um, uh, and my sole purpose is to, um, uh, is to introduce uh, uh, the moderator, Cappy Hill, who's going to then introduce the, the panelists. Um, uh, first, two short uh, announcements. First, at um, about 3.40, about 10 minutes after this session is scheduled to end, we're going to have a group photo um, on the steps of uh, Chapin Hall. So if people, especially the CDE alums, faculty, and CDE students could make their way over there, that would be uh, much appreciated. Um, secondly, a, uh, a reminder for um, uh, that group uh, to, that of the dinner tonight uh, at 6 o'clock at, uh, at the faculty house, and of course the talk uh, then at 8 o'clock tonight by Joe Stiglitz at the 62 Center. Um, it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Catherine Hill. Uh, uh, Cappy, as she was known here at Williams, is now the 10th president of uh, Vassar College. Uh, she was a member of the economics department here since 1985. Uh, during that time period, uh, she served both as uh, uh, chair of the CDE and uh, later as provost of the college. Um, she had earlier stints uh, at the World Bank and the uh, Congressional Budget Office before Williams. Uh, Cappy uh, has widespread experience with developing countries and indeed lived in Zambia uh, for several years in the 1990s with the uh, Harvard um, Institute for International Development. Um, she's written widely on those experiences. Uh, she's also a uh, recognized expert, along with several in the room, uh, including, I see, Gordon Winston and Dave Zimmerman on the uh, economics of higher education. Um, she graduated summa cum laude from Williams College, uh, has uh, uh, degrees from Oxford University and a PhD from uh, Yale. Both in her time as chair of the CDE and as provost, uh, Cappy was instrumental in preserving and, uh, and growing the CDE, which is current chair, I'm uh, deeply grateful uh, for that. Um, I should note, by the way, that this is merely um, a practice that I hope will continue, only an abbreviated bio, the extended biographies of all of the panelists and speakers uh, today and tomorrow and both nights uh, are on the CDE website. With that, I turn it over to you. Okay, thank, thank you, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry, for that very nice introduction. Um, it's really just wonderful to be here today. My first interactions with the CDE were actually in the mid-1970s when I took classes as an undergraduate at Williams with Vince Barnett and John Sheehan. Uh, Bill Gates introduced me to economics, to development economics in my freshman year, and I was just absolutely immediately hooked. Then when I returned to Williams, uh, I taught in the CDE for many years in both the 1980s and the 1990s, and as Jerry mentioned, I was director for several years in the early 90s. One of my absolutely most memorable experiences was team teaching economics 501, 502, the core development economics class with Henry Bruton. Uh, I think Henry made this happen somehow, hoping I would take over his signature class uh, when he retired which he went on to do several times after that, actually. Uh, a sabbatical to Lusaka, Zambia, and then administrative jobs interfered with his plans and mine to take over that course, but it was an amazing learning experience for me to team teach with Henry. Henry Bruton, John Sheehan, and Paul Clark have all been incredibly important uh, to the CDE legacy. And without them, the CDD, CDE would probably not exist today. Uh, which be, would be an incredible loss for Williams and for the development community and for developing countries more broadly. So today, in this session, we're going to talk about the CDE. It's past and the way forward and the importance and difficulties of education and capacity building 
in developing countries. 50 years ago, when the CDE was founded, there was optimism that we would have success in promoting economic growth and increased well-being in developing countries around the world, having experienced success in Europe post-World War II with the Marshall Plan. Colonies were becoming new independent nations at a remarkable rate in the early 1960s. The hope and expectation at the time was that perhaps the CDE and similar institutions would be obsolete by the start of the 21st century. While there have clearly been success stories, a significant share of the world's population still lives in poverty. What went wrong, what went right, and what have we learned? Are we optimistic that the next 50 years will accomplish what we failed to accomplish in the previous 50? And what role will the CDE play in this? So in a moment, I will introduce our panelists. And then we're going to engage in a conversation about the CDE, uh, education, and development. We hope to get a conversation going rather than a lecture. And at the end, we hope to take questions from the audience. So please think about some of the things that you'd like to ask us uh, and co or comment on. One of the challenges in supplying development assistance is to avoid dependency and not undermine the capacity for self-help. This challenge exists in many kinds of aid, including aid for education and capacity building, which is going to be our primary topic for today, although I don't promise that we won't stray from it some and go on to other development issues. David Ellerman, in Helping People Help Themselves, opens with a quote from John Dewey as follows. The best kind of help to others, whenever possible, is indirect and consists in such modifications of the conditions of life, of the general level of subsistence, as enables them independently to help themselves. So that is our challenge. I haven't really been deeply involved in development economics for almost a decade now, uh, being distracted by, by other things over the last 10 years. But coming back to it and thinking about this conference, this celebration this, this weekend, I realized that the mission of assisting de developing countries, with education and training in particular, isn't really much different from the mission of a liberal arts college, which is now my day job, which is to help people learn how to learn, be critical thinkers, and have a way to creatively and effectively have them go about solving problems. So I want to mention two important intellectuals, philosophers, and teachers who have contributed to thinking through these issues. First, going way back, of course, is Plato's Socrates from the 5th century BC, who made it clear that the goal of education was not answers or truth, but through dialogue to help students become independent learners and thinkers. More than two centuries later, in 1965, in one of the early textbooks on development economics, Henry Bruton commented that perhaps in the field of development economics, making students think about problems is more important than providing them with possible solutions to those problems. So this brings us to our discussion uh, for today's session, and let me introduce our panelists. First, we have uh, Fakhruddin Ahmed, uh, Dr. Ahmed served for two years as chief, chief advisor, prime minister for the caretaker government of Bangladesh from January 2007 until elections in January 2009. His administration presided over elections that were viewed as the freest and fairest in the country's history. The government led by Dr. Ahmed carried out a series of reforms over two years aimed at strengthening democracy and establishing good governance. Before serving as chief advisor, Dr. Ahmed was the governor of Bangladesh Bank, the nation's central bank, from 2001 to 2005, and was managing director of the world's largest apex microcredit fund from 2005 to 2007. Outside of Bangladesh, Dr. Ahmed had a 20-year-long career with the World Bank in various posts. He holds a BA and MA from Dhaka University and an MA from Williams College and a PhD from Princeton University. Our next panelist is Elsie Kanza. Elsie Kanza is economic advisor to the president of Tanzania, a position she has occupied since March 2006. Before that, she was principal financial policy analyst for the Ministry of Finance for more than three years. From 1997 to 2002, she worked for the Bank of Tanzania, the nation's central bank. Ms. Kanza has an MA in development economics from Williams and an MSc in finance from the University of Strathclyde. 
In 2008, she was an Archbishop Desmond Tutu Leadership Fellow. Our third panelist is Michelle Denevers. Michelle Denevers is Senior Manager of the World, Bank, World, World Bank's Environment Department, managing programs on climate change and a wide range of other environmental topics. Michelle joined the bank group in 1981 and worked on industrial development programs in the South Asia region. From 1991 to 1996, she worked on environmental programs in the Latin America region and was the first coordinator for the Global Environment Facility there. Between 1996 and 2000, Michelle was sector manager for environment in the Europe and Central Asia region. Uh, and from 2000 to 2008, she worked as a manager and director in the World Bank Institute on environment and capacity development programs. Michelle was instrumental in launching the World Bank's uh, greening and corporate social and environmental reporting initiatives. So please join me in welcoming the panelists. And I'm going to start with a fairly general question, and I'm going to turn to Dr. Ahmed for the first question. And so here it is. Uh, coming back to the development literature after several years, I notice a new humility, perhaps with one or two exceptions. Do you think that the CDE has taught humility over the years, and do, do you think that your institutions, the World Bank or the government organization with which you work, have learned this? And if so, what difference does it make? Uh, thank you, uh, Katrin, for the introduction and for introducing uh, this afternoon's uh, session. As um, I drove this uh, morning with my wife from Albany to uh, Williamstown, I was retracing the same route that I took 40 years ago. 40 years ago in the uh, autumn, that means September of 1970. So it's exactly 40 years after that I have come back to Williams. When we were at, when he came to Williams, I was a young public servant, a young civil servant. He came here to learn the tools of economics, to learn how really economics works in theory and also in practice. There were professors, teachers, who gave us the best that was known at that time in this discipline. Here is Professor Bruton. Development economics is something I think which is almost synonymous with his, with his name. We learned from him development economics. We learned from other teachers, if I remember some of them, like Paul Clark, Steve Lewis, Roger Bolton, microeconomics, macroeconomics, trade theories, even some bit of econometrics. When we went back after almost nine months uh, surviving the winter of uh, Williamstown, <laughs> we f I felt enthusiastic. I felt that, yes, we have learned a good deal about economics, about economic development, about how development has taken place in, in terms of economic history. And we felt that, look, we would be able to use that knowledge and make a difference. Difference in our respective countries, difference in the lives of our people from the developing world. When I come back today, after 40 years, uh, I have come back with a great sense of humility. As uh, Catherine, you yourself mentioned. Uh, humility because I have been able to, in a sense, see participate and do something about economic development in my different capacities. And I've learned that economic development is a much more complex phenomenon than really what, was, what one can find, find in textbooks. Uh, when we came to Williams, or CDE, 40 years ago, we talked about development, we talked about growth. We hardly, if I remember, talked about poverty. That's something which came later. And we have learned that poverty is even more a complex phenomenon. It's much more difficult to handle, tackle, even with the successes that we have had in many countries across the globe, 
even with the successes that many countries, including mine, have had in terms of moving people out of the traps of poverty. Was 50 years uh, too short, too long? Let me tell you, when I went back 40 years ago, I thought, really, the 40 years would be long enough time to deal with the problems that uh, we faced in our respective countries. Obviously, it hasn't happened. That's why I come back again, as I say to Williams, uh, with a sense of, sense of humility. Now, some of the issues that really have, in a sense, uh, come to uh, engage the attention of, let's say, the policymakers, the practitioners, and uh, if I may dare so, the academia in terms of economics or in terms of development, um, is really how to crack the, uh, the nut of poverty. And I think, uh, Catherine, I'll put the, the, the topic that you outlined that um, education and capacity development in that context. Uh, education, we have all come to recognize and learn, is extremely important. Extremely important for growth, extremely important for development, and also important, uh, if I may use the term to reduce poverty and to reduce inequality. Uh, similarly, some people will say about health. But if you look at the experiences of many countries who are dealing or are trying to come to grips with the issues of poverty, somehow or other, it seems to me that education and capacity building both still remain areas where a lot needs to be done, done more than we have been able to do uh, so far. In education, at one point in time, many of us thought that well, access is the most important thing. Many of us thought that it's the public, public sector's responsibility to provide education to its children, to the kids. Um, many of us thought that it was a simple solution, that you go and set up schools, large numbers of them around the countryside, and you, the children will go to school and the problem will be resolved. And we found that that's not the only issue. There are other issues which came up. And to some extent, there are issues which really require answering the question that how do you deliver good education to the children of citizens from various strata of the society? To me, it's an important question, both for poverty and to bring in inequality, to bring inequality to a level which is socially acceptable, morally justified. And um, at least from Bangladesh, where I have had some experiences, you may have found, what has happened is I find that access has increased, has improved. Okay. Uh, there are the issues of quality still remain, serious issues of quality in terms of what kids are learning at school, and serious issues regarding access to children of poor parents. Sometimes I feel that there is a, a kind of a dichotomy which is appearing in the system. There are children from poor rural background whose access to quality education is much more limited than those who are relatively well off, affluent a bit, live in the cities and have access to education provided particularly by the private sector. How does one deal with this, this kind of a situation is something I think really it seems to me will be important in future. If really education is to fulfill the role that one expects it to fulfill, that it equalizes opportunities across. Uh, that's to me is an important, important issue that will remain. Great. Second is providing or delivering services for education. I mean, the, there are times, and I think it is still true, 
that it is the public sector's responsibility to provide education to the children of its citizens and to do it in the public sector. In other words, both finance it and deliver it. Now, there is also a set of problems, I think, as I have seen in, in some of the countries I have worked on, that the public sector delivery of education services is not always the best way to, to do it. Now, what are the alternatives? That's, again, something one can, one can think of in some of the places that we have seen. I think there are other questions that one can raise about, you know, can the NGO sector, which has come up as almost a third sector, provide better delivery of education? Can the private sector delivery be such that really that equality of opportunity between students of different economic and financial background can be ensured? So that's, those are the set of questions that really are, are extremely important in my mind if we want to move on with the objective of poverty alleviation and together with poverty alleviation, if I may use the term in many countries that you're finding, equalize opportunity or reduce inequality, or some would say even inequity. Uh, you also mentioned, Catherine, about capacity building. It's again an extremely important issue because that's also limited to the issue of delivery that I raised. Well, is there capacity within the country, in the public sector, to deliver what is expected of the public sector? And how does one increase and enhance capacity? Education is surely one of the, one of the ingredients, but that's not enough. Institutions are important. And how do you build good institutions? To me, it's easier to take sometimes even, shall we say, difficult policy decisions, all right? One takes a decision and one either sort of sings or swims with it. Institution building is a much, much more difficult issue, is a difficult thing. And how does one learn about institution building? Uh, policy, yes, we learn in textbooks that, okay, your trade policy should be this or this policy should be that. Now, what institution building, this is something which really, I think, is becoming more and more important if we want to pursue the goal of shall we say, poverty uh, alleviation in the, in the world. I think, uh, Catherine, I'll stop there and then- Great, the great. Thank You've you. actually answered all of my questions. So it's gonna make it much more difficult for me to have the rest of this session, but. So I'm gonna turn to Elsie and Michelle and ask you to focus on, on the issue of just humility in the development economics area. And we'll come back to talk to it, or you can comment on Dr. Ahmed's comments, but we'll come back to the education issues as well. So Elsie, would you like to say a few things? Or? Okay, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for your kind introduction, as well as for the invitation to participate um, in this uh, very important anniversary celebration. Um, one of the most important things that I remember from my time at CDE was Professor Henry's um, admonition to to be quick to answer and slow to so quick to question and slow to answer. There are no easy solutions uh, to the problem of development. And I was here ten years ago, and I've been with the presidency for the last five years or so. And the the ex my experience with the Ministry of Finance, even on the central bank, but then also within the presidency has mirrored increased humility on the part of policymakers, on the part of development partners about what you can actually deliver in the field of development. And I'll just focus on one area in which we're um, increasingly becoming aware, and that's the issue of community demand-driven development is actually empowering the communities themselves to be the drivers of the development solutions. So not the policy makers, not the leadership, not the development partners. Um, just one example of where this has had phenomenal results is uh, we recently embarked on a program of expanding secondary schools. Um, I take the point that uh, my colleague here mentioned that governments have focused a lot on building and increasing access to the schools. I think it's also important to bear in mind that the communities also want the schools. You know, their children have passed, 
and they can't have access to secondary schools. So, so what do you do? So the state decided to just to let them continue with the building of the schools and then accelerate the other support services that go along with buildings. So, for instance, between 2006 and 2010, with community participatory construction, 2,171 secondary schools were built around the country. Between 1961 and 2005, 1,202 new schools were built. So this is just one illustration of having a different approach and the humility that comes with it, that the communities themselves can actually be much, uh, much more impactful in driving development than we policymakers or so-called government or other development partners. Michelle, let me give you a slightly different question. Um, Dr. Ahmed mentioned that poverty is an incredibly important issue and one of the real challenges and I think one of the reasons that we should remain humble about our accomplishments over the last 50 years. And I would say that that's equally true in the United States as it is in, in many developing countries. The poverty rate has gone up recently in the U.S. It's, a, it's an issue that we have trouble addressing. I, I think education is part of the solution and we'll turn to that in a minute. But I wanted to just ask uh, some, of, some comments on an area that you know quite a bit about, which is the environment and how that intersects with uh, economic development and the challenges facing us over the next 20 years. I think that's something that probably we didn't talk much about 50 years ago and has increasingly become important. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Catherine. And let me just say that it's a great pleasure to be here today. I guess I'm one of the few people in the room who was not at Williams. And in fact, this is the first time I've ever been here. And it, you know, it's obviously a very beautiful place. I was glad that you were able to put on good weather for me to see it today. And, and the beautiful leaves. So I'm really very honored and happy to be here and to be with former colleagues like uh, Fakhruddin Ahmed and Ishrat Hussein, who you'll be hearing from later. Um, as, Cappy, as Catherine said, I have worked in the World Bank for about 29 years. I've worked in just about every geographical region. Before that, I was a Peace Corps volunteer. So I have a number, a lot of miles under my belt in terms of thinking about these development questions. And um, and we still sit around in the World Bank with our colleagues and say to ourselves, you know, what works? What works, what doesn't work? It is true that 50 years ago we thought that, um, that it would be easy, or not easy, but we thought that 50 years would probably solve the problem, and we're not, even though there have been tremendous gains in the last 25 years, um, more than the number of people living in extreme poverty has been cut by half, the global child mortality has been cut by half. So there have been very significant gains towards the Millennium Development Goals. But as many people know, there still are problems. In the World Bank, um, and this actually relates to the question of humility that was the previous question, we only started thinking about the environment about 20 years ago. And the World Bank has been in existence for more than 60 years. And that was due to pressure from external shareholders, external stakeholders. And I have to say that uh, it's, it's usually uh, lessons brought in by external stakeholders that are the source of humility in the World Bank. I think the World Bank is, I am not an economist, but I work in an organization with approximately 3,000 people who have PhDs in economics. And they've all studied in places like this where there are good models and sometimes there's good data and there are a lot of very strong hypotheses, and people think they know what they're doing until they find out that it doesn't work. <laughs> and environment was one of those areas. Uh, when, it, when we first started out, we thought about the fact that we had to make sure that we, we didn't do any harm. We didn't make people worse off because of the <laughs> environmental costs or the environmental degradation that would occur through the normal de process of development. Over the last 20 years, our thinking has become much more complex, like the concept of poverty. And um, 10 years ago, we did the first environment strategy in the World Bank, where we actually looked at the linkages between poverty and environment. And those of us in the environment community thought, well, shoot, this poverty focus is really going to put us out of business. But it didn't, because when we started looking at closely at who are the people that are most affected by environmental degradation? Who are the people that suffer from indoor air pollution? Who are the people that suffer from toxic waste? It's the poorest. Who are the people who are most affected by natural resource degradation? 
It's the poorest countries, the, the lowest income countries depend on natural resources for 30% of their income, whereas the richer countries, the top quintile, is only about 4% of their, of their income comes from natural resources. So the more we looked into it, the more we found out that the livelihoods of the, of the poor depend tremendously on uh, good environmental quality and good environmental management, and health and safety depend on good environmental management. So that has been something that has become much more integrated into development thinking in the last 20 years. In the last 10 years, the big impact has been thinking about climate change. And as we think to the future, climate change is enormously uh, connected with development and is potentially a threat to the development gains that have been made through uh, impacts on whether it's temperature rise that affects agriculture or sea level rise that affects the vast majority of the population that lives in, in urban areas on coastlines, um, climate change is something that will really have to be incorporated into development thinking. And this is something that is actually be, being very well um, integrated into the thinking of development uh, planning and economics and planning for climate resilience, planning for low carbon growth is something that is becoming, I think, quite widespread in the, in the development profession now. So in that sense, climate change has provoked, I think, more attention to environmental sustainability than we had certainly 20 years ago. Okay. Um, Elsie and Dr. Ahmed, would you like to comment just on, before we turn, I'm going to want to turn a little bit more to education specifically, but can you give an example of something where you think policymaking has actually worked quite effectively in your country? We're being rather on the pessimistic side. So have you got an example of something that has worked quite well that you're proud of? Me? Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I um, a couple of things um, I'll, I'll mention. One is um, that um, schools, primary schools, run by the NGOs. Uh, and in Bangladesh, uh, there are quite a number of good NGOs, uh, really, who are operating. BRAC uh, is uh, supposed to be the biggest NGO in the world today. It runs a series of schools uh, in rural Bangladesh. And they are run quite well. BRAC also works with uh, those children who haven't gone to school, somehow or other, and try to pick them up and give them schooling so that they then can go into the mainstream. So there are some, some such good examples of really, as I'm mentioning, delivering good services in the education sector. That's at the, at the one end. Um, at the other end, there are good private universities, there are good private, sec private uh, schools managed and run by, uh, in the private sector. Now, the question then is that, yes, you have a good system of schools. They are at the higher level. But they are the question of, of the income uh, the, of the parents and whether or not children of poor parents can have access become an important issue, therefore. So I can just, as I say, uh, in, the, in, the, in the higher education, it was found that the demand was so high that the government was not being able to really uh, increase the seats or set up new public universities. So they allowed the private sector to set up universities in, in, in Bangladesh. And some of them are doing, doing reasonably well, but obviously they you know, are going to charge the full fee and not a, or not a, not a fee which really <coughs> makes access to poor students possible in the, as in the public sector universities. Elsie, do you have something you'd like to comment on? Well, I'll just share uh, one area where we've seen successes uh, with a different approach, and this is in the health sector in particular. And I'll focus on just one area of success, and that is that Tanzania is on track to meet the MDG for, um, for bringing down mortality of children under the age of five. A major reason for that success is uh, a decision to distribute insecticide-treated nets um, for free 
to children under the age of five nationally, that's a national program, um, as well as to make it available to pregnant women for free as well, although now the, we've actually gone beyond that to allocating at least two bed nets uh, per household because it was, it was thought to be discriminatory. Um, why favor just women who can be pregnant by allowing them access uh, to the means to preventing malaria? Um, part of, or a, a large part of the success um, of this story was in part uh, a strategic partnership between the private sector, a local company, A to Z Textile Mills, Sumitomo Chemicals from Japan, which actually developed the technology, the Oliset Net, um, as well as local research and development undertaken by the Ifakara Research Health and Development Health Research and Development Center, um, which is essentially looked at the effectiveness of this long um, long time in insecticide treated nets and discovered that they were extremely effective in preventing malaria, and that in turn encouraged, you know, encouraged the government to look into it as a strategic intervention to ensure that more families, more households would have access to these nets. Um, and so since 2007, um, well, it began, beginning in 2003 and then again to 2007, there's a dramatic increase in the production in the textile mills um, to make sure that these nets were available locally in the country and now they're producing for the rest of Africa based on this single success. Okay, that's great. Let, let's turn a little bit more to education now. Um, that's my current job. Uh, and a, a major goal at Vassar has been to increase access to low-income students as a means of addressing equity and uh, improving welfare in the United States. We talked a little bit about that earlier. And I've actually come to think that investments in education around the world, including the US, along with health, are probably some of the best ways to improve welfare. So what I'd like to ask you guys to do, and you've already started a little bit, is to think about if you, is this true in your country, um, or do you think this is generally true given your experience in the development world, and one or two ways in which you would intervene. Um, Dr. Ahmed, you mentioned that uh, in Bangladesh, NGOs and private schools are doing a, a fairly good job of, of intervening and, and meeting an unmet demand. Very interesting issue in the United States right now is the fact that the publics and the traditionally not-for-profit private schools have not been able to meet the demand, and the private for-profit sector has been stepping in and growing incredibly rapidly, and yet there's a question of whether that's, it's, it's, do, it's happening in a way that's actually going to improve welfare or not. So a very hot topic in the United States, and worrying why we, the private nonprofits and the publics, somehow can't meet the unmet need. So do you think education is, is incredibly important? And if you wanted to relax a, a constraint, what would be the one or two things that you would do? Let me take a crack at, the, at your question. One is, of course, I mean, I think the answer is straightforward. Education is important, not just important, extremely important. Uh, it's not just a question of, uh, shall we say, uh, bringing out the best in an individual, but it's also for the nation as a whole. After all, you know, the individuals make a, make a nation. Uh, the issue, um, of course, is, as you were just again pointing out, how do you uh, really make sure that the services are provided to the citizens uh, across the board? in a way that uh, is equitable. Uh, it's a, not an easy question. There are several sets of issues. One is, of course, the question of the whole question of the cost itself. Uh, in developing countries, I think the governments have accepted the, if I may use the term, responsibility of providing education for its, uh, the children of its uh, citizens or the children uh, at the elementary level, even at the sometimes at the secondary level, uh, really in a subsidized manner, either free or let us say in a subsidized uh, way. Now the question that comes to my mind is really whether the government really has to also deliver those services themselves. If we accept that it is the government's responsibility uh, to provide education because of whatever reasons, externality and, and all the rest of it, uh, does the government also, is the government the best 
uh, sort of, shall we say, delivery agent. That's something which is, to me, is a question, I think, which uh, has to be answered and may, may have to be answered in different ways in different, uh, different countries. That's uh, one thing in, in my, my view. And the other one is, coming from Bangladesh, I think the whole issue of institution building the, and the issue of governance of the institutions have become linked now in the schooling system of Bangladesh. Uh, who manages these schools and how are they managed? Uh, what kind of committees? Who are on the committees? These are important issues and the governance of those schools uh, will have an important input in really the output of uh, those schools. So that's also a, a, an issue which I think one will have to um, grapple with and, and address. Uh, basically, again, if I may come back and raise the question that you, you said, capacity building or education, fundamentally to provide good education means good institutions. And how do you build up good institutions in a developing country? I think is something is something really one one has to has to address. I don't I dare not say there is any unique solution, but I think this is an important important question. Elsie, yes, sure. Uh, well, I echo the fact that education is extremely important um, for Tanzania. It accounts for the largest part of our national budget, with about twenty percent of the current national budget. Um, just. Looking back historically, we're very often compared to some of the Asian countries that have done really well and saying what happened at the time of independence vis-a-vis -vis where we are today. But the reality is that at independence in 1961, we had about 120 university graduates. That's post-colonialism. Two lawyers, two engineers, 12 medical doctors. How do you run a country? Extremely difficult. Um, now in 2010, and we have approximately 120,000 students enrolled in tertiary education. Again, not a very big or dramatic um, shift, because at the end of the day, somebody has to run the country. Somebody has to run the schools. Somebody has to develop the infrastructure that's required. Somebody has to work in the factories, etc. cetera. Um, some of the efforts that the government has, has made to increase access to education, um, give more uh, people a chance to be effectively deployed, has, uh, has had dramatic, if, a dramatic effect and impact in terms of increasing the number of students who are getting access to education. Um, a major partner in this for us has been the World Bank, actually, and DFID, et cetera. But for example, between 2000 and 2010, the number of students in primary school increased from about 4.4 million to about 8.4 million, and in secondary school from about 260,000 to 1.6 million. So that's a dramatic increase in number of students in a classroom, but just because you have students in classrooms doesn't mean that they're learning anything. And so we come to the issue of quality. And there we start to see the constraints. So for instance, we have a teacher demand of about, well, over 100,000, estimated to be closer to about 130,000 today. And we're talking about uh, student to teacher ratios or teacher to student ratios of about one to 50 or to 50 to 100, depending on where the school is located. Um, I think here it's what, one to 30? What's your average? Probably. 50, approximately less. In the US, one to 20. In the US, yeah. And in terms of textbooks, we need about 13.5 million. So it's a, it's, a, it's a huge challenge. So one of the ways one of the, the avenues that we're exploring right now is deploying um, internet communication technology in trying to bridge this gap. Uh, we have examples in the region of some efforts that are being undertaken in partnership with uh, large technology companies. So for instance, in Ethiopia, they recently launched a program with Microsoft using cloud computing with, and uh, providing access to teachers with laptops, which essentially allows teachers to have access um, to quality educational support on a real-time basis, but it also reduces the inequity between schools that are in urban areas where teachers prefer to be located vis-a-vis -vis schools in rural areas. Kenya's already embarked on a similar program. Um, Tanzania's on track. Tanzania's also exploring with, uh, this is with Microsoft, Intel, um, not so much IBM, 
but anyway, major companies again, um, providing, using, um, it was like video conferencing or teleconferencing technology to allow a single teacher, for instance, we have a major shortage of math and science teachers, and I understand in the US you have a similar problem as well. Um, but at least to be able to use one teacher to be able to teach several classrooms at the same time. Um, and this is essentially a stopgap measure because technology is not a solution to everything. But it takes time to train the teachers. It takes time to get them through um, you know, uh, quality teacher training programs as well. And so these are the, some of the avenues that we're exploring to bridge that gap. Michelle, do you want to okay. make some comments? Um, well, I'm not, I know very little about education. I've never worked in the area of education. But I do live in Washington, D.C., which many of us think of as our own personal developing country here in the United States. <laughs> I grew up in California, which when I was young had the best quality of public education in the country. Now I live in Washington, which on a statewide basis has the worst quality of public education in the system in, this, in the country. And for the last four years, I think this may change now because we have a new mayor, but for the last four years, they have been going through a very interesting um, I would say experimentation in some sense with how to improve what really is the worst performing system in the country. And uh, they're introducing a number of uh, approaches to try to address the problem. What I think is relevant about the approach in Washington and is relevant for developing countries is they're trying things and then measuring the results. So they're adopting a kind of an experimental approach where they're testing and, and measuring results, which I think is not just in education, but in de development more generally, an approach that needs to be adopted. Um, when I think of, there are a number of examples in developing countries. There was, a, I think, a fa fairly well-known study done by the MIT Poverty Lab in a small village in India where they had large classrooms and a lot of kids and they had problems with um, attendance, kids attending. And so they thought that what they needed to do was add a second teacher to the classroom. So they went and they did one of these randomized evaluation studies, and they determined that for one-tenth of the price of adding a second teacher, if they actually just dewormed the kids, they eliminated the problem of absenteeism um, at a much lower cost. So that's an experiment that happened in India. We have an experiment happening in Washington, D.C. Another one that I'm aware of is in Uganda, where you have, you have the supply of education, but then you have the demand for education, which involves the transparency of, of the governance of education. And what they've done in Uganda, I don't, I don't know if they're doing it in Tanzania, but they have, um, they've basically posted on the wall of the schools the budget that was allocated by the government to that school so that everybody in the community can see how much money there is in that school and what it's going for, how much should be going to the teacher, how much should be going to instructional materials, because they had a problem with leakage in the budget, and then performance of the children. So you have the ability of parents to hold the school system accountable. And that experience in Uganda is something that's now being spread to a lot of other develop, developing countries. So this kind of try things and see what works approach, I think, is important in education and, yeah. and more broadly. I think that's been a real change in development economics quite broadly. I think the Washington, D.C. example is a very good example, however, of not only does, does uh, holding people accountable and actually testing and experimenting is important, but also the importance of politics because, in fact, the mayor that was making this effort has gotten voted, well, maybe voted out. In he which was. Case, he was he voted was. out. And, and probably because and of this. Because of this, and that the head of the schools who was, imp who was implementing all of these changes is going to be looking not, for a job. Not clear yet, so. but um, Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, despite the fact that Henry Bruton continually, t continually has been trying to teach me for 20 or 30 years that there's no simple answer to these things, uh, when I look at uh, foreign aid in Africa, I wonder where we would be if we had allocated most of the dollars to education and health rather than to the variety of things that it was allocated to. So my question now is just, is there a role for donors and international organizations in the education and health sector from your experiences that could be effective? Would this be an area where if we were to reorient uh, our efforts, we could be productive in a way that we maybe have not been for the last 50 years, in some cases? Anybody who'd like to give that a try? 
Um, I, there has, these things go, you know, like, like a lot of economics. Um, I, my, my, the president of the World Bank recently said that if you took all the economists in the world and laid them end to end, you could not come to a conclusion. And <laughs> that was, you know, he was quoting George Bernard Shaw. But th there have been a lot, you know, over the years, various approaches to, to development economics that have been tried and come in fashion. The Washington Consensus, I think, is a later session today, things that are in and out of fashion. But I think education and, and health have always been important, and I think have always been important for the donors as well as, as, well as the, the countries that are you know, in, embarking on these challenges. Things like infrastructure investment, um, macroeconomic policy stability are important. They have to be there, but uh, you know, education is, is critical. I think the question for the development community is who is the best partner to supply that? Is it best done by a large organization like the World Bank or is it best done at the community mm -hmm. level with community support or with NGOs like they do in Bangladesh with uh, Grameen and Brock? You know, these are some of the development questions that are being studied. I think uh, the, uh, the World Bank and, and other donors uh, have been uh, financing education for many, many years, and for good reasons. Um, the question, I think, is that um, how do you make, make it more effective, and more effective to achieve the objectives that uh, one has set for uh, oneself, whether it's in the education sector or largely in the context of poverty or economic development? Uh, and I come back to the question, I think, that you are hinting out or raising is, in many cases, I would as I guess that the constraint is not uh, resources in terms of financial resources, but the constraint is in the capacity to deliver, to implement. That I think is, is often, uh, co you know, is, is a binding constraint. Uh, I personally think that uh, in terms of uh, donor support, support for education sector, would continue to be there. I mean, as I think Michelle was saying, in some, some years or in some uh, you know, decade, it may be higher than in other, other, other years or other decades. But by and large, I think it, there is a support at the base level for education has continued, and I, I guess will continue in the future. Uh, the question is, if you want to increase that in terms of uh, resources, then in some countries, I just say that you'll run into the constraint of, of of capacity, of institutions, of delivery. That's why I think some of the experiments that one is talking about also become, become important of how you handle the issues of really providing the services, the quality of services that everybody would like uh, to, uh, to provide. So that's, I think, somewhere I think one needs to focus. Um, to me, it seems to me, is a greater attention than, than otherwise, if it's not so. I have a, I'd like to approach this from a slightly different point of view. Um, and this has partly been shaped by my background, which is that although I'm Tanzanian, I actually grew up in Kenya and went through a Kenyan education system. And one of the things that I observed uh, while working with the government and with donors, particularly when I was with the Treasury, was that for a long time, we were arguing with the donors uh, development partners because of the emphasis on primary education. And they were not willing to extend support to secondary education, so, but you know, once the students have gone through primary education, what are they going to do? They're not effective um, actors in the economy, in society, but they were unwilling to extend resources to the next level. Inevitably, that led to a crisis. And so we had to have this crash program of developing secondary schools to now absorb this mass of, uh, of primary school students having achieved almost full universal primary education at about 97% currently. So my issue uh, in terms of the, of the support to the education, one, there's no argument that it's been important always, education and health, um, but the key issue is sustainability. Because a lot of these costs, whether it's in the educational health sector, we're talking about public, um, public facilities, and therefore, it's the state then that has to employ teachers, that has to employ um, healthcare workers. Um, the private sector will always try to do that as efficiently as possible. 
Um, the largest number of employees in Tanzania at the moment is government workers, and they're mainly healthcare workers or teachers, and that will increase. Um, development partners are not willing to allow their resources to go directly into supporting recurrent expenditure, which is salaries. So we quickly have to start thinking how are governments are going to be able to manage these budgets on a sustainable basis. And when you approach it that way, then you really have to come back to thinking, so how are we enabling these countries to grow their domestic resources? Because education and health absorb resources. They consume resources. They don't produce resources in the short run. Um, and so if we, if we accept that there needs to be a more balanced approach, then we need to allocate resources, not just, uh, this is development partner resources, not just to education and health, but also to um, aspects of the economy which can drive you know, a generation of greater domestic resources or revenue. So whether it's infrastructure development, whether it's uh, entrepreneurship, whether it's industrialization, et cetera. Okay. Um, I'm gonna change the direction a little bit, go with one more question, then I'm gonna open it up to the audience. So one other thing that has changed in the, in the last 50 years is that there are new players on the world scene. And this goes from countries that were previously uh, really not on our radar screen, either as donors or as foreign investors. Uh, there are countries that have grown incredibly rapidly, figured out how to do it. Uh, and there are nonprofit, incredibly wealthy nonprofit uh, foundations that are now part of the international development uh, world. So I just want to ask in any of these areas, are these things good things or bad things? Uh, is there something to be said for having a little competition amongst those hoping to contribute to uh, economic development in contrast to cooperation and, and coordination? Um, and then we can also maybe extend this and just ask generally, certainly I think two of the players who are out there now are China and India, what have we learned from them? So I hope you can each maybe contribute a little bit to that and then we'll open okay. it up. Uh, let me make a brief comment, a few brief comments on that. Um, if I look back 40 years ago, uh, you know, the primary player for development was the public sector. Right? I mean, that's essentially really what we were dealing with, or essentially the primary focus was on the public sector. Uh, slowly, we learned that um, public sector cannot do many things efficiently, and uh, therefore, uh, the wisdom was that um, private sector has an important role to play. And therefore, there is a public sector and there is private sector. There are at least two large groups um, within, within a country or an economy. And slowly over time, we uh, experienced in some countries uh, more than in others, I guess, that there is a third sector which is, which is emerging or has emerged. And you can call it non-government organization, non-public sector, or not, neither public sector nor uh, private sector, but it's called a non-government sector, an NGO. These institutions um, were set up with some kind of philanthropic objective, if I may use the term, and slowly grew, and grew in size and its outreach, and in the different issues of development that they were trying to address, whether it's education, it's health, it's uh, social protection, it's advocacy, you, you name it. I mean, it's women's empowerment. So basically then we have a third group of institutions. And with that has come now primarily from, let's say the developed world, the philanthropic contributions, right? The best known, I guess, is Gates Foundation, or there will be many others, really, um, who provide funds for social justice, economic development, or poverty alleviation, or whatever other, other issues they may be thinking of handling. So then, therefore, we now have, um, in a sense, at least uh, three sets of players, uh, the public sector, the private sector, and the, uh, the NGO sector. It's good to have some competition in some sense between the three, or at least between the two. I mean, I was mentioning, let's say, in delivery of services. The NGOs can provide delivery of services of health, health and education. So can the public sector. So at least there is a, a, a competition. 
there is an incentive or pressure on the public sector to at least be able to compete uh, better with the um, NGO sector and even sometimes the private sector. Uh, that's one way of looking at it. But I think there is another way that one can, one can look at it. And that's how do you bring in synergy between the three sectors? How do you get the best in terms of your objectives? And I would like to think that the objectives, private sector, of course, profit motive, but still they are providing an important function in terms of the growth of the economy, the employment generation, and through that, ultimately, to poverty alleviation. How do you, how does the public sector policies and the private sector uh, profit motive then really go together to achieve the objectives? Similarly, the NGOs or the philanthropic part of the, uh, shall we say, resources, how does that then synergize with what the public sector is doing, what the private sector is doing, and how do, how do you get then the best possible result in terms of, uh, as of, from the resources that really are being put together from, from these different sectors. And I think there is uh, something uh, that one can think of developing, shall we say, frameworks uh, really under which all the sectors can then operate their optimum, uh, the optimum results. Michelle? Mm -hmm. um, I think this is actually a really interesting question, and it's a, it's a pretty controversial question. Uh, among the new players, you have what are called the new donors, which would be China, Malaysia, Brazil, others, um, and they're also investors. So you have competition not just in terms of financial flows, you have competitions in terms of ideas, in terms of of development models. And I think having China come in and with massive investments in Africa, which are admittedly very self-motivated, they're looking for resources, but they're bringing a different perspective than the traditional development community. Um, official development flows before the financial crisis were a small share of total development flows, of total financial flows to developing countries. So they're a small player in some countries larger than others. And now you have you know, countries like China sinking hundreds of billions of dollars into Africa. I mean, one of, the, one of the good things that's happening is that they can speed up the access to energy agenda in Africa where you know, worldwide there are 2 billion people, 2.3 billion people who have no access to electricity. And in Africa, about 80 plus percent of the population has no access to electricity. You have China going in building coal-fired power plants, building hydro. They can accelerate the hydro development, which was going at a very slow pace. One of the reasons it was going at a slow pace was because of the environmental and social safeguards that the official development community had to pursue in order to develop a hydro dam so that you have a country like uh, Laos where it took them 10 years to do the studies to put in place the Namtun Dam. And the same thing is the case in Africa. The, Flip side of this is that new investors like China and Malaysia, when they go to Africa and make these investments, they don't, they're not bothered with environmental and social safeguards. And they're not bothered with the number of people who may be displaced by building a big dam for hydro or you know, other environmental impacts. So you have competition, which I think is very healthy, and you have new development models. China is a country that has lifted the most people out of poverty in the history of the world. It's a phenomenal accomplishment. And there are a lot of countries that are interested in learning from that, from that experience. How did they do it? Uh, India has also been very successful. Many people say in the race between China and India as to who will be you know, the biggest success, the question is whether the Indians can build infrastructure faster than the Chinese can learn English. So those are kind of two extreme models that are, that are out there. And having these new players, I think, uh, brings a lot to the story. But I'd be very interested to hear from an African perspective. Well, thank you, Michelle, <laughs> for that provocative statement. And um, my first response would be that China and India are not new donors um, for many of us, particularly for Tanzania. China has been... Uh, very supportive of our development agenda for the longest time. Um, uh, and the, most, the largest symbol of that is actually the Tanzania-Zambia Tanzania Railway, the Tazara. And to the great 
I mean, arguably, uh, but the fact is China as an investor is actually a more recent phenomena um, rather than it's more um, the, the role that it's played in the past. Um, in terms of environmental safeguards, I think that's our responsibility. Um, it's the country that has institutions that's, that are supposed to ensure that the environment um, is safeguarded. Uh, we have um, a body that's responsible for that, and they're quite strict, both to local and international investors, and I think that's a responsibility of the state. It has a responsibility to its people um, to ensure <laughs> that they are safe, uh, regardless of who undertakes the investment, including the governments themselves, because sometimes the largest culprits are the governments themselves. Um, I'm going to step away from that and just go back to um, the different perspective, I mean, the issues that uh, Fadruddin raised about this, um, the introduction of a new player, and this is philanthropic foundations, uh, civil society. Actually, civil society has become redefined now um, with, the entry, with the entrance of uh, players like the Gates Foundation and other CSR arms for large multinational companies. And one of the challenges that we're seeing with that, on one hand, it's very important that they enter into partnerships with the government and with the other traditional players to ensure that synergies and leveraging of um, everyone's uh, comparative advantage are maximized. Uh, but the challenge that we're starting to see is that these new philanthropic foundations, because they tend to stem from, from companies, um, they're used to paying top dollar for the best talent. Now, you're operating in environments where talent is limited, and so they're drawing this limited talent from governments, um, from development partner organizations, from the private sector, and so they're competing for talent and pushing up prices. So that's becoming a little bit of a crisis now, <laughs> because these are projects, and projects have a finite uh, life. You know, They have a beginning and they have an end. At, at the end of the project uh, cycle, you have to mainstream this talent, and we're finding that the, all the prices are going up. So you, the cost of your factors of production in the private sector going up. In government, it's becoming almost impossible to cope, so you're losing um, the capacity that you need in government. And, um, and some kind of balance needs to be struck there. So there's, there's new governance issues also emerging because these philanthropic foundations also do not have the traditional accountability frameworks uh, with the traditional development partners. At the end of the day, they have parliaments, so they have people that they are accountable to. Um, in our developing countries, despite the problems that we have, there's still some level of accountability towards parliaments. Again, who are these companies accountable to? Who is uh, the Gates Foundation accountable to? Right, or anybody else for that matter. Bill and Melinda, I think. Yeah, is the Bill answer. and Melinda Gates Foundation. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Maybe we should pick on somebody else as well. But, but these are some of the things we need to think about. Or the Global Fund, for that matter, where you have a pooling of resources from different foundations. I think these are some of the new emerging challenges. Okay, those were some great answers. I think we're going to now turn it to the audience, and I hope people have some questions. What I'd like you to do is. Tell us who you are, and then direct the question uh, either generally to everybody or to somebody in specifically. And speak loudly so the people behind you can hear. Hi, my name is Jorge. Uh, I'm a junior. And this is a general question. Um, Michel, whenever to your, your point or your example about uh, deworming students in India, I think it was a good example of that. Or an important point that education, or the, the students' ability to learn is very dependent on external factors that are not strictly uh, encompassed in what it means to be uh, and what it uh, means to deliver education. And I'm just wondering, understanding that it's the government's role to uh, provide a good, edu a good education, whether there's a tendency to encompass, like in the Department of Education, whether there's a tendency to encompass external factors and what it means to deliver education, whether that be addressing health or addressing uh, um, problems at home, or whether there's increased cooperation between different government sectors to address these issues. And I was wondering if you could uh, give, I, I guess, specific policy examples that have worked. Hmm. OK, as I said. Oh. Uh, I think the, the question was really within government that's trying to deal with issues of education. Are, are governments, do they recognize and have a way of, of dealing with the fact that uh, health issues and issues in the home and in the community may have as big an impact on the ability to supply education as supplying a teacher in a classroom. So it's the, it's the, the overlap and the fact that it's complicated. 
Right. I mean, it's complicated. And uh, as I said, I don't know anything about education, but I know in Washington, the problem is not just the fact that, you know, the school buildings are falling down and there's no, well, there's no doors on the bathrooms. So that's a problem for keeping kids in the classroom. You know, they have to go somewhere else um, to use the facilities. Um, so, you know, to what extent is the problem, does, should the, I think I, if I understand your question, it's to what extent is, should the government step in and to provide, you know, to provide solutions to the lack of child nutrition, the lack of preparation for preschool, no books in the home, whatever the problem is. I think that that is, a, is an answer that really depends on, varies from country to country, and it's a sort of a country ownership question, which I will pass on to my <laughs> colleagues from countries. Well, I, I do think educators and economists who think about these things understand the complementarity and a lot of the, um, you know, the, the, Michelle mentioned these controlled randomized tests that are now much more part of the development literature than they used to be. I think these kinds of things are the issues that are, can be addressed with those, those kinds of tests. So yes, I think, I, I, I guess I'll answer that and say I think it is part of what countries are thinking about. Okay. My question is, how do you deal with this? So we have this vicious circles and you can uh, break through. So I think to summarize the question quickly is that one of the constraints in, in uh, education may be having teachers who are really quality teachers and doing what you want them doing in the classroom, because that's so important. But how, how, do, you, how do you intervene and do that? No. Yeah, yeah. How to be how to be effective teachers. Yeah. Any any thoughts? Well, I guess the I mean it's an important issue, but um, it's a sort of issue which is I'll link it to the broader issue of on the quality, quality of education and the quality of teachers. Right? And again. Uh, you mentioned about curriculum, uh, etc. But again, as you change the curriculum, as you print books which are better books, etc. Uh, this is also a process, a process of, uh, shall we say, creating quote and unquote better teachers. If um, the teachers who can provide knowledge, uh, as you were, you were saying, better than the, their earlier cohorts. But basically, it's, it's teacher training, and uh, through the training, can one really impart what uh, makes a better teacher? Uh, I would hazard, I guess, still there will be individual teachers who have found a way of, of doing this than others. But I, I, would, I would think that it's possible to improve uh, the quality of the teaching community or the teaching profession. Uh, through training, and um, if really the training is, is focused on achieving whatever objectives you, you want to achieve uh, through teaching or through teachers. Oh, I just want to respond to, okay. uh, to the question raised, and I wish to come back to a point that Professor Henry Bruton made this morning, and which is that there's a difference between schooling and learning, and I think that's a very important point. And... Um, and very often we tend to assume that just because you've gone through an education system, you've actually learned how to do something. I think, uh, at least for us, in, in our case and in Tanzania increasingly, we're realizing that it's very important to build the capacity of learning by doing. It's not just sufficient to have the degree, et cetera, however you got it, but what can you actually do with it? Um, and just to illustrate a very short example is that until about 2006, 2007, we only had three neurosurgeons in the country. So fortunately, um, the president was able to encounter one of the best neurosurgeons, actually American, uh, because he needed some treatment. And out of that uh, started an NGO, a project, and which was training, the emphasis of which was training trainers, working with trained medical doctors in Tanzania, working uh, initially in a rural part of, of Tanzania, and just teaching them how to do um, these complicated surgeries. So first they would observe, second they would do together, and then third, the medical doctors from, uh, the neurosurgeons from America would supervise and then leave. So since 2006 to date, 120 surgeries have taken place in the country by these doctors who've been trained more or less on an intermittent basis and also by consultations online. So this is one way in which you can transfer capacities. And the key thing was they did not want to, to build dependency. 
So it's a true transfer of the knowledge and ability to do something that they were not able to do before, despite the fact that they were trained medical doctors. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Isaac Osset, uh, 1977, from Ghana. Uh, I think the panelists, you know, talking about education, I've talked about uh, education which most of us have known, going from primary school to secondary school to university. I'm wondering um, their, what their thoughts are on uh, technical education, you know, training of electricians and plumbers, those types of apprenticeships, for example. Um, in Cuba, for example, you know the work which is being done by paramedics, you know. In my own country, traditional attendants go through a certain course and they are able to deliver. You know, I want them to tell us about their thoughts because the type of investment that we make in the formal education system, you know, uh, we, we don't have to make the same type of investment at the level that I'm talking about, vocational, technical, uh, you know. Other, maybe lower level, not, tertiary, not full tertiary education, but who still deliver what most of our people want. I want your thoughts on it. Okay. So the question is really uh, technical education and supplying uh, educating people who can, or training people who can do certain things for which there is a demand in the country that maybe the formal education system is not the best at delivering. Uh, obviously, uh, as you mentioned about some of the technical education fields, they are extremely important. There's no question uh, about it. And uh, some of them are provided in the public sector, uh, vocational institutions or other technical institutions. Some of them are provided in the private sector as well, because in um, the private sector, there is a demand they find, and then they provide the services. Now, the other, I thought, one point that you mentioned was interesting to me was the old question of, all right, paramedics or something, someone like that. Uh, I think that's an important, important issue. And uh, the way, um, see, one, one looks at it, or I would look at it in a, in a country where large, numbers of people are yet to be provided with the best quote unquote medical service because of shortage of resources, both financial and human. How do you deliver the service? And I think in that context, um, the issue of paramedics, barefoot doctors or whatever one may call them become important. I think China is a country which has done very well with this kind of an approach. Uh, in many countries, I think even, I think in the US, in a far outlying areas, there is the whole issue of how do you provide medical service there? I mean, uh, there are these whole, whole questions. And to me, it seems that one may have to opt for not the first best, but the second best, and then aim for the first best over a period of, period of time. The two sets of issues here, one is the cost as you, as you allude to, in terms of the cost of, let us say, uh, producing a doctor instead of a, a, a sort of a licentiate or a diploma holder who can provide you know, reasonable care for the sick. And uh, the other issue also is that it may be difficult to really force the doctor really to go to an outlying rural areas and provide the medical services, whereas a kind of a diplomat uh, or a diploma holder rather uh, may be willing to do it. So that's a sort of a policy choice. I think one, one will have to decide really as, uh, as uh, one goes on. It's difficult sometimes because we all want to get the best. In terms of health, say, why not the best? Okay, there is a good argument, but if it is not within, within reach and large section of the population are without health care, even the minimum health care, how do you then provide that? And then I think what is what you are alluding to may be a, a good, good strategy. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dr. David McIntosh, class of uh, 1776, CDE. Just two quick comments. The first one has to do with the benefits cost benefit analysis. If we were to put a dollar fee to 
to the amount of Africans, just one the African region, that have studied outside of Africa in the best schools you can find. And after study, then what? So if the emphasis is on just this development of the human capacity, human capital on our side. And then the domestic policies and programs push you out. And then the policies in the developed countries pull you in. Then we'll be in a vicious cycle. I've been wondering, the last 30, 40, 50 years, you know, how many of us have really studied in this country? And in other countries, I remember once uh, when I was in Boston, we did a study, a quick study, we discovered how many students, it was costing us half a billion dollars just to train us, those figures that we put our hands on. And at the end of the day, I wonder how many of us, the percentage, I went back to the county. So why are we worried about this training and training at home, which is a very costly, costly affair on our government, on our country's resources? We can see the utilization aspect. I hope one of these days we we'll begin to address that. The second point I want to make is that I would like for the panelists to make one or two statements minus, uh, minus uh, Michelle. You are the back, uh, I'm the back myself. I'm the executive director on the board of the bank, uh, the boardroom, and she knows the back. Continue, we have the head trying to figure what happens. But uh, the title here is the OCDE. Colon or semicolon, I'm not really good at that. Lessons learned and facts found. I'm just curious, did we change that topic? Or do you want to save it for the last? <laughs> <laughs> I would say that by discussing education and capacity building, we were true to that topic. Uh, and on the CDE question, I used to know the data on the number of people that went back to their home countries to work. Uh, it used to be about 90%. Jerry, I don't know whether you have a... 93. 93%, which I think is a very strong answer uh, to your question. So I think we'll leave it at that, and uh, thank you, everybody.